It's Tuesday, May 3rd. President Biden blasts what he calls a radical Supreme Court draft opinion to throw out the landmark Roe v. Wade abortion rights ruling that has stood for half a century. Furious Senate Democrats vow to vote on legislation to protect abortion access for millions of Americans. As Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer claims conservative justices lied to the Senate during their confirmation hearings when they assured senators abortion access was settled law. Several of these conservative justices who are in no way accountable to the American people have lied to the U.S. Senate, ripped up the Constitution, and defiled both precedent and the Supreme Court's reputation, all at the expense of tens of millions of women who could soon be stripped of their bodily autonomy. Governor Gavin Newsom and the state's legislative leaders say they will put an amendment on the ballot in November enshrining the right to abortion in the California state constitution. Ukrainian fighters say Russian forces have begun storming the sprawling steel plant in the besieged port city of Mariupol after the United Nations Humanitarian Coordinator for Ukraine confirms 101 women, men, and children and older people evacuated the Avastol Steelworks. Former President Trump's hold on the Republican Party put to the test today in the GOP primary in the state of Ohio. And don't look now, but COVID-19 appears to be getting up off the deck with infection numbers rising again in a number of states and an ominous new sub-variant of the virus on the loose in South Africa. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. Ukrainian defenders said today that Russian forces began storming the steel mill containing the last pocket of resistance in Mariupol. Just as scores of civilians evacuated from the bombed-out plant reached relative safety in the Ukrainian-controlled city of Zaporizhia, about 140 miles northwest of Mariupol. The refugees told of days and nights filled with dread and despair from constant Russian shelling. Asnat Lubrani, the UN humanitarian coordinator for Ukraine, said that thanks to the evacuation effort over the weekend, 101 people, including women, the elderly and 17 children, the youngest six months old, were able to emerge from the bunkers under the Asvastal steelworks and see the daylight after two Two months. William Demisler reports from Riga, Latvia. They managed to get that 101 people uh, out of the Azov style steel plant that, of course, has been under incredibly uh, severe bombardment for a number of days as Russian shelling uh, even continued after those 100 or so people managed to escape. Of course, this all comes after a few weeks ago, Russian President Vladimir Putin said he wanted such a a strong besiegement of the Mariupol area that not even a fly could get in. So there are certainly massive concerns on reports that uh, Russian forces are now moving into that area. William Denisler reporting from Latvia. The news for those left behind was more grim. Ukrainian commanders said Russian forces backed by tanks began storming the sprawling plant, which includes a maze of tunnels and bunkers spread out over four square miles. How many Ukrainian fighters were holed up inside was unclear, but the Russians had put the number at about 2,000 in recent weeks, and 500 were reported to be wounded. Ukrainian's Deputy Prime Minister Irina Vereshok said a few hundred civilians also remained there. 
House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced that lawmakers will take up the Biden administration's proposed $33 billion funding bill for Ukraine when they return to Congress next week. Meanwhile, the United Kingdom's Prime Minister Boris Johnson today announced $375 billion in military aid to Ukraine and said Kiev will prevail. We who are your friends must be humble about what happened in, in 2014. Because Ukraine was invaded before, for the first time, and Crimea was taken for, for, from Ukraine. And the war in the Donbass began. And the truth is that we were too slow to grasp what was really happening. And we collectively failed to impose the sanctions then that we should have put on Vladimir Putin. And we cannot make the same mistake again. Pope Francis told an Italian newspaper that he has offered to travel to Moscow to meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin to try to end Russia's war in Ukraine and suggested the invasion might have been provoked by NATO's eastward expansion. The Pope said he made the offer about three weeks ago. He still hadn't received a response from Moscow. President Biden today visited a Lockheed Martin plant in Alabama that manufactures Javelin missiles. He thanked the facility's workers for manufacturing the missiles that Ukraine has used so effectively against Russia's invading forces. On Capitol Hill, the top two U.S. military officials talked about replenishing U.S. stocks of Javelin and other weapons of war that the U.S. has sent to Ukraine. There were no discussions of peaceful resolution to the war, which is now almost 10 weeks old. Eileen Alfandari reports. The Biden administration says it has sent 5,500 Javelin anti-tank missiles to Ukraine since Russia's invasion began on February 24th. On a visit to a Lockheed Martin plant in Alabama, Biden praised the workers who manufacture the missiles, which cost just under $80,000 apiece. They're highly portable. They're extremely effective. In fact, they've been so important. There's even a story about Ukrainian parents naming their children. Not a joke their newborn child, Javelin or Javelina. Not a joke. Biden took a moment to urge Congress to pass the $33 billion package of additional aid he wants to send for the Ukraine war, about $20 billion of which is military funding. He didn't mention the hefty corporate profits military contractors have reaped from the weapons transfers, but he did remind the workers at the plant that building weapons provides for their paychecks and those of many others. Being the arsenal of democracy also means good paying jobs for American workers. In Alabama and the states all across America where defense equipment is manufactured and assembled, 265 people here at this plant are directly employed working on the Javelin program. All told, Lockheed Martin has brought nearly 3,000 jobs to Alabama. The armed forces of the United States of America are going to continue to be the best armed, most capable fighting force in the history of the world. On Capitol Hill, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, testified to a Senate Appropriations Subcommittee on the Biden administration's record overall request for military spending for the next fiscal year. $773 billion, a 4% increase from last year's record spending. The U.S. already spends more on its military than the next 11 nations combined. Austin said U.S. stockpiles are stretching thin after the transfer of thousands of Javelin missiles and shoulder-fired Stinger missiles to Ukraine. But he assured senators that military contractors are increasing production. Austin also reflected on the Russian military failures on the ground in Ukraine, despite Russia having what he said was lots of modern military equipment. We saw them not... Uh not able to support themselves logistically. We saw them make some uh, bad assumptions at the very beginning of this. Uh, we saw them uh, fail to integrate uh, aerial fires with their ground maneuver uh, and just a number of missteps. And, and I attribute a lot of that to, to a lack of leadership at the lower level. Uh, and we saw uh, Russia push uh, its senior officers forward as a result of that, and many of those 
uh, were, were killed for, from being forward on a battlefield. Up to now, Russian President Vladimir Putin has called the invasion a special military operation. General Mark Milley said if Putin were to take the step of formally declaring war, as some believe he may, it would allow him to conscript and mobilize additional forces. Austin said it's questionable how well brand new soldiers could be trained before they were thrown into combat. But there's no question that every day the military conflict continues. There's the risk of a deliberate or accidental escalation into all-out war between Russia and the West. George Beebe is at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and was a special advisor on Russia to Vice President Dick Cheney from 2002 to 2004. He recently authored an article asking, tell us how this war ends. Appearing on Democracy Now!, Beebe said if Putin were to formally declare war, it should be seen in a larger context. Putin would argue that this is not actually a war between Russia and Ukraine, that this is a much larger war between Russia and the United States and NATO. Uh, That's how uh, Russian elites and Putin have been depicting this conflict actually for many years, well before Russia's actual invasion of Ukraine on February 24th. Bibi said Putin and those around him see the Ukraine conflict as a fight for Russia's survival and believe the stakes are existential. He says U.S. rhetoric has shifted in the last few weeks to open discussion of a victory over Russia. Bibi says such escalation in objectives by both sides add up to a very dangerous moment. I'm Eileen Alfandiri for Pacifica Radio. This month, the presidency of the United Nations Security Council is in the hands of the United States. And the U.S. is expected to use the position to focus the council's attention on the Russian war in Ukraine. Simon Marks has the story. Part of the focus is expected to be on the humanitarian crisis there, with the World Food Programme estimating that 47 million more people in 81 countries will experience acute hunger this year because of the Russian invasion. Jim Lindsay of the Council on Foreign Relations explains. Almost half the people in Ukraine are now food insecure. You can expect an awful lot of finger pointing to be going on over the course of the month of May. The United States blames Russia for contributing to the current food crisis. Russia retorts that the problem isn't Russian actions, it's Western sanctions. Now, to put things in perspective, Ukraine and Russia supply about 30% of global wheat and barley supplies, a fifth of the world's corn, and over half of its sunflower oil. And uh, to put things in perspective, global food prices in March were 34% higher than last year. So this is an inflationary impact that extends worldwide. Russia held the presidency of the Security Council back in February before the invasion of Ukraine had begun. It will be the turn of China to helm the body this June. Simon Marks, Washington. The State Department said today it has determined WNBA star Brittany Griner is being wrongfully detained in Russia. That means the U.S. will more aggressively work to secure her release while the legal case in Russia against her plays out. Griner was detained at an airport in February after authorities said a search of her bag revealed vape cartridges containing traces of cannabis oil. U.S. officials previously stopped short of classifying the Phoenix Mercury player as wrongfully detained. The president of the WNBA Players Union says it's time for Griner to come home. It's not clear what prompted the shift in approach to Griner's case, although the Biden administration has been under pressure from members of Congress and others to make her release a priority. The U.S. last week secured the release of Marine veteran Trevor Reed as part of a prisoner swap that also resulted in a convicted Russian drug trafficker being freed from prison in the United States. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online, kpfa.org. And if you are listening to KPFK in Southern California, today is the first day of the fun drive for Pacifica radio station KPFK in Los Angeles. And if you're listening to this newscast and 
like hearing this newscast, appreciate what this newscast brings to you, as well as any other programming that you get on this alternative radio station, KBFK in Los Angeles. Please support us financially because 90% of our financial well-being depends on you, our listener. Nine out of every $10 that we expend to keep this radio station on the air comes directly from you, the listener, and it comes in the form of us asking you to support us as we program the programming that you're listening to and hopefully like enough to support financially as we do it on the air. So please go to kpfk.org. It's kpfk.org or call 818 818- 985-5735. That's kpfk.org or 818-985-5735. President Joe Biden today denounced what he termed a radical Supreme Court draft opinion that would throw out the landmark Roe v. Wade abortion rights ruling that has stood for half a century. The court cautioned no final decision has yet been made, but Biden is warning that other privacy rights, including same-sex marriage and birth control, are at risk if the justices follow through on what their draft says. Chief Justice John Roberts said he had ordered an investigation into what he called the egregious breach of trust in leaking the draft document last night, which was dated to February. Opinions often change in ways big and small in the drafting process, and a final Supreme Court ruling is not expected until the end of the court's term in late June or early July. Across the nation, though, Americans today grappled with what might come next. The Democratic-controlled Congress and the White House both vowed to try to blunt the impact of such a ruling, but their prospects of so doing look dim. Christopher Martinez reports. It was nighttime when Politico published a leaked draft Supreme Court opinion overturning the 1973 Roe v. Wade abortion decision. Reaction was swift. It's a fundamental shift in American jurisprudence. President Joe Biden spoke to reporters on the tarmac at Andrews Air Force Base in Maryland Tuesday morning, where he was departing for a trip to Alabama. It concerns me a great deal that we're going to, after 50 years, decide a woman does not have a right to choose within the limits of the Supreme Court decision in case number one. But even more, equally as profound is the rationale used. And it would mean that every other decision relating to the notion of privacy is thrown into question. Later in the day, Vice President Kamala Harris spoke at a convention of the group Emily's List, saying women's rights in America are under attack. Those Republican leaders who are trying to weaponize the use of the law against women, will we say, how dare they? How dare they tell a woman what she can do and cannot do with her own body? How dare they? Justice Samuel Alito drafted the 98-page opinion in the case of Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization, complete with 30 pages of appendices and a history of abortion laws. His conclusion? We hold that Roe v. Wade and Casey must be overruled. He blasted Roe as egregiously wrong, saying Roe was on a collision course with the Constitution from the day it was decided. Democratic lawmakers were outraged. This is a dark, disturbing morning for America. Chuck Schumer of New York is the Democratic Senate leader. The Republican-appointed justices reported votes to overturn Roe v. Wade will go down as an abomination. One of the worst, most damaging decisions in modern history. There was also swift reaction from the other side of the aisle. Republican Senator Josh Hawley of Missouri tweeted, If this is the opinion of the court, it will be one of the greatest opinions in Supreme Court history. But his response was an outlier for Republican Congress members. More typical was Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell, whose statement avoided Roe v. Wade, focusing instead on the leak and calling for punishment. Liberals want to rip the blindfold off Lady Justice. They want to override impartiality with intimidation. They want to elevate mob rule over the rule of law. 
That drew the ire of Democrat Schumer, who joined other Democratic senators at a news conference on the draft ruling. He says the word that best describes the Democratic caucus is infuriated. Republicans are spending all their focus on the leak because they don't want to focus on Roe v. Wade. They know they're on the wrong side of history. They know they're on the wrong side of the American people. So they're ducking it. Senator Patty Murray is the first woman senator from the state of Washington. She calls the draft a five-alarm fire, saying for the first time, the next generation of women will have fewer rights than their mothers. Mark my words, they are not going to stop with Roe and the right to abortion either. They are coming for your birth control, for all rep reproductive health care. Unless a majority justice changes their vote before the ruling becomes official, the Supreme Court will overturn Roe v. Wade and let states decide their own abortion laws. Twenty-two states already have some form of abortion ban on the books, some recent and some dating back to before Roe v. Wade. Senator Debbie Stabenow is a Democrat from Michigan. Michigan women are particularly at risk. If Roe goes away, my state reverts to a very... Uh, patronistic law from 1931, 1931, that makes abortions at any stage a felony with no exceptions for rape and incest. The Supreme Court is expected to issue its final ruling in late June or early July. Senate Leader Schumer says he's scheduling a vote on legislation to codify Roe v. Wade into law, but that faces a tough road because of the Senate filibuster. But former President Barack Obama and Michelle Obama have another idea. They issued a statement urging people to vote in the November midterm elections. Because, they say, in the end, if we want judges who will protect all and not just some of our rights, then we've got to elect officials committed to doing the same. Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. Marjorie Cohn, former president of the National Lawyers Guild and professor emerita at the Thomas Jefferson School of Law in San Francisco, spoke with Mitch Jezerich on the Letters and Politics show on the legal reasoning in the draft ruling by conservative associate Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito. The Supreme Court said that uh, abortion is not a fundamental right. It is not grounded in the Constitution. I mean, this is Alito said this in, in his draft. And as you said, yeah. uh, the scuttlebutt is that the other right-wingers, with the exception of Roberts, who wants to have it both ways, apparently, um, are going to sign on. Um, but I think one of the most interesting things about this decision is that at the end of the decision, um, the Supreme Court says that it sets the rational basis this test for reviewing state laws because what would happen if they overturn Roe v. Wade is that then the states are free to enact laws outlawing or limiting abortion. And if abortion was a fundamental right, which Roe and Casey said it was, Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, then it would, any law that aims to limit abortion would be subjected to strict scrutiny. But since the Supreme Court would be saying in this Alito draft opinion that it is not a fundamental right, then it would require only a rational basis. Um, and so if states can regulate abortion for legitimate reasons, basically any rational basis at all that the state provides would uh, withstand any constitutional scrutiny. Um, also, I think I think it's interesting that, um, well, not interesting, but frightening, I would say, that if this does become the opinion of the court, then the rights to contraception, to private consensual sexual activity, homosexual sexual activity, same-sex marriage also may be on the chopping block because they d are not specifically uh, found in the Constitution. Now, when the Supreme Court decided Roe v. Wade, it found, it basically uh, found that there was a right to privacy, and they looked at several constitutional amendments and said all of these amendments, even though they don't mention abortion, uh, contain a right to privacy. Then, 20 years later, in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the Supreme Court said, uh, in, they reaffirmed the central holding of, of Roe v. Wade, and also went a little further and said that any restriction on abortion um, that provides an undue burden on a 
woman's right uh, to abortion would be struck down, but they grounded the right to abortion not in the right to privacy, as the Roe Court had done, but rather in the due, the, um, due process clause's liberty interest. And what the Supreme Court said, or I, I keep saying the Supreme Court, they have not issued an opinion yet, this is the Alito draft. <laughs> what the draft says is uh, that this is not uh, a due process protected issue because any such right that protects liberty under the due process must be deeply rooted in this nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty. They said it's not deeply rooted in the history and tradition because um, up until Roe, many states had criminalized abortion and they actually included a 30-page appendix with all of the old um, state statutes criminalizing abortion. Um, And uh, Alito also wrote that um, this right is not implicit in the concept of ordered liberty because unlike other rights, this is different because you're talking about human life. But even if the Alito ruling holds and the Roe versus Wade decision is wiped from the books altogether, that won't be the end of it. So says Amani Gandhi, senior editor of Law and Policy at Rewire News and co-host of the podcast Boom Lawyer, who spoke with Brian Edwards Tinker on the Upfront Morning Show. For starters, she says there are these so-called trigger laws in some 11 states that will automatically criminalize abortion immediately upon Roe v. Wade being officially declared unconstitutional. I would expect that other states are going to kick it into high gear when it comes to passing laws that criminalize abortion, such that within a few months, um, about half the states in this country will have abortion criminalized, which um, creates a real crisis when it comes to abortion access. It's going to create a situation where people are going to have to start from abortion hostile states to abortion friendly states. We're now seeing some state legislatures like Missouri for for instance are starting to move legislation through the legislature that would would either forbid residents from traveling out of state to get abortion care or that would would um, allow the, the abortion hostile state, a state like Missouri, to reach its long arm of the law into another state and criminalize or make liable for providing abortion, abortion providers who don't even live in the, the original state. So that was a little bit garbled. Let me explain what I mean. Let's say Connecticut, for example, has just recently moved through its legislature a bill that would essentially would essentially immunize abortion providers in the state for providing abortions that are legal in the state if they are provided to people who are coming from out of state, right? So that includes surgical abortions. That includes someone in Connecticut who writes a prescription for medication abortion pills to someone in Missouri, and then Missouri wants to criminalize that Connecticut resident. We're going to see more states doing that because it's going to create a real it's going to create a real problem for federalism, which is the ways in which the state interacts with the federal government. But it's also going to create a lot of problems for what we call comedy, which C-O-M-I-T-Y, not Kaha comedy, which is the ways in which states interact with each other when it comes to obeying each other's jurisdictional rules, each other's criminal laws. Uh, generally, states tend to have uniform criminal laws. If something is a crime in Missouri, it's also going to be a crime in Connecticut. But we're entering a world where... Half the states are going to think that something is an immoral, horrible crime, and the other half are going to think the states that are saying that it's an immoral, horrible crime are themselves immoral and horrible. So we're going to have a situation where Missouri is going to call abortion murder, and they're going to say, well, we should be able to go and grab someone in Connecticut or Illinois or California or Oregon or any friendly state and make them face justice in our state. And those states are going to, Connecticut at least, is saying, no, you can't do that. We are not, we are going to not allow um, our law enforcement agencies to cooperate with your law enforcement agencies, meaning we won't be doing any extraditions of our residents to abortion in hostile states. It means um, Connecticut is going to permit abortion providers in the state to counter sue when they are sued under a bounty hunter style law like Texas has, right, where you are allowed, anyone in the country is allowed to sue someone in Texas if they have performed or aided and abetted an abortion, an illegal abortion, which in Texas is an abortion past six weeks. And so um, it's, it's going to be, I think that there's been this sort of myth 
that, you know, and it's a myth that I think Alito sort of um, played to in his opinion that all we're doing is just throwing abortion back to the states, right? There's nothing in the Constitution that says anything about abortion. In fact, during the olden days, in the days of the, of the white wigs and the, and the, and the, 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 the property owning gentlemen, abortion was criminalized then, which is actually not true. But his argument is that from an originalist standpoint and from a sort of moral standpoint, Roe is wrong. He says it was egregiously wrong from the, from the moment it started or something to that effect. So we are looking at a world where half of this country is going to be absolutely polarized against abortion. The other half is going to be absolutely polarized for it. And at the end of the day, this is going to hit pregnant people, low, low income pregnant people, black and brown pregnant people, the hardest. And it's, it's a tragedy. I mean, quite frankly, it is, I think it is torture to force a pregnant person to carry a pregnancy to term and they don't want to. Um, it is deadly in many cases. It's fatal, particularly for black women. And it's just, it's immoral. Amani Gandhi is senior editor of Law and Policy at Rewire News. Protests around the country were called for this evening at 5 p.m. at federal buildings and at state capitals. Several are underway at this hour in our listening areas. In Oakland, uh, 5 p.m. was the start time for a protest at the Ronald V. Dellums federal building in Oakland. Two protests underway in San Francisco, one at the federal building. The other was to start at 5 p.m. at uh, for, uh, Powell and Market Streets. And in Los Angeles, a protest has been called for 6.30 tonight outside the U.S. Courthouse in downtown Los Angeles. That's at 350 West 1st Street in L.A. California Governor Gavin Newsom and the state's legislative leaders say they will put an amendment on the ballot in November to enshrine the right to an abortion in the state's constitution. Newsom, Assembly Speaker Anthony Rendon, and Senate President Pro Tem Tony Atkins said in a joint statement that the U.S. Supreme Court can't be trusted to protect reproductive rights. So California will build a firewall in the state constitution. Atkins called the leaked draft of the U.S. Supreme Court ruling overturning Roe v. Wade more than just a gut punch. California has long, long recognized the fundamental right to privacy and to control over one's own body. And now we are going to make sure that right is enshrined in our constitution. I will be introducing a constitutional amendment that will make it crystal clear that reproductive rights in California, including and specifically abortion, are protected. Atkins said it will take two-thirds of a legislative vote to put the constitutional amendment on the ballot, and then a two-thirds vote of Californians. Planned Parenthood of California President Jody Hicks noted that even though California is a national leader in protecting the right to abortion, adding the layer of a constitutional amendment is now vital. I think if we've learned nothing from uh, what's happened in the last couple of years, but certainly the draft that, that came out yesterday, is that 50 years of precedent, settled law, and the right to privacy is not enough. And so if we can put any layers of protection, not just for today, but for our future generations, then, you know, I'm personally grateful that, that they're willing to do that. And, you know, this is the first time that we're leaving um, to our children, less rights than than we had. The Guttmacher Institute has predicted California will see a 3,000% increase in out-of-state women seeking abortions if Roe v. Wade is overturned. The chair of the California Women's Legislative Caucus, Christina Garcia, said she's been working with colleagues on a package of bills to bolster reproductive rights for Californians and the out-of-state residents who are expected to flood the state seeking abortions once they're outlawed elsewhere. Overturning Roe v. Wade is not going to stop abortions. But rather, it's going to lead to unsafe and deadly abortions, especially for our most marginalized and vulnerable communities. Our communities of color, our LGBTQ communities, our low-income communities, our rural communities, and other marginalized communities. This is a matter of life and death that we are talking about with you. 
One measure would establish an abortion support fund, which would provide grants to California organizations that assist patients in overcoming barriers to abortion, including those traveling from other states. Another would protect patients and abortion providers in California from out-of-state civil liability judgments for providing abortions that are banned elsewhere. A third bill would enhance privacy protections for medical records against disclosures to law enforcement and out-of-state third parties seeking to enforce abortion laws in other states. There are also measures to beef up the workforce and extend financial support to abortion providers. Oklahoma's Republican Governor Kevin Stitt signed a Texas-style abortion ban today that prohibits abortions after about six weeks of pregnancy. Part of a nationwide push in Republican-led states, now more hopeful than ever that the conservative U.S. Supreme Court will uphold new restrictions and even repeal Roe v. Wade. The bill Stitt signed takes effect immediately with his signature. Abortion rights advocates already have challenged the new law in court. It's not clear when the Oklahoma Supreme Court might issue a ruling in the case. The new law prohibits abortions once what is considered cardiac activity can be detected in an embryo, which experts say is roughly six weeks into a pregnancy before many women even know they are pregnant. A similar bill approved in Texas last year led to a dramatic reduction in the number of abortions performed in that state, with many women going to Oklahoma and other surrounding states for the procedure. The bill authorized abortions if performed as the result of a medical emergency, but there are no exceptions if the pregnancy is the result of rape or incest. You are listening to the Evening News on KPFA at Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, KFCF in Fresno. Online at kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast airing each night at 6 o'clock. With a half-hour edition on the weekends, I'm Mark Miracle, and once again, this is the first day of fund of the Spring Fund Drive at KPFK in Los Angeles, where you may be listening to this radio news program right now. And if so, we need your financial support on the first day of our fund drive here in Los Angeles. Please go to kpfk.org. That's kpfk.org or call 818-985-5735. 818-985-5735. The premise of this listener-sponsored station is pretty daggone simple. It is that if you listen to this radio station and get something out of it, we need to get something out of you in return. We're asking your, for your financial support because that is the way we survive. There's no commercials. There's no unru- underwriting. There are no rich people behind this broadcast enterprise. There are no religious groups. There are no foundations. There are you, the listeners, Please give us a call, 818-985-5735 or online at kpfk.org. LGBTQ lawmakers in California and 18 other states are acting to protect trans children and their families who may travel to seek gender-affirming medical care. Several states, such as Texas and Alabama, have already banned such care and are threatening providers and their families. Sam Canfield reports. San Francisco State Senator Scott Weiner is leading the national effort to introduce refuge laws to shield trans kids and their families from penalties when they go out of state to seek gender-affirming care. We are not going to enforce these laws uh, in our states or in our courts. We're not going to become uh, an arm of the law for the state of Texas or Alabama or, or anywhere else that chooses to criminalize our community. Um, We're not going to honor subpoenas uh, from these states that are seeking, uh, for example, medical records relating to gender affirming care to be used for or criminal purposes in those states. And we are not going to allow our law enforcement officers um, to enforce uh, these vicious laws in our states. Brianna Tatone is the first openly transgender state legislator elected in Colorado. She said she experiences hate on a daily basis on social media. 
With the leak of a draft Supreme Court decision to overturn the right to abortion uppermost in many people's minds, the tones that anti-abortion and anti-trans rhetoric are connected. It's no coincidence that abortion rights are being challenged in the same year that there are the most anti-trans laws in history that have been proposed and passed. There are two sides of the same coin in this fight, and the same people are fighting with the same justifications, and it's about control over people and pushing the evangelical Christian agenda. It's time that we take a better defensive position. We know the attacks are coming, so it's time that we don't take a hit on the chin and then react, but instead put up a shield. A transgender refuge law is likely to win easy passage in California. But even lawmakers in some red states like Florida, Georgia, and Kentucky said they'll take up the battle to protect trans kids and their families. I'm Sam Canfield, reporting for Pacifica Radio, KPFA. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has restated its recommendation that travelers wear masks on planes, trains, and buses, despite a court ruling last month that struck down a national mask mandate on public transportation. The CD says that people aged two and up should wear a well-fitting mask while on public transit, including in airports and in train stations. The CDC cited the current spread of coronavirus and projections of future COVID-19 trends. A Florida federal judge struck down the federal mask rule on April 18th. The CDC asked the U.S. Justice Department to appeal the decision, which the department has done. The risk of the spread of COVID-19 in New York City has been raised from low to medium as cases rise, despite hospitalizations and deaths remaining low. According to health department data, while the positivity rate in the five boroughs has risen from a seven-day average of about one and a half percent in early March and three percent in early April to nearly six and a half percent as of last Friday, in recent months, hospitalizations have remained flat while deaths have declined. Data shows the city saw a weekly average of 44 people hospitalized after contracting the virus to 40 New Yorkers in the most recent figures. City Health Commissioner Dr. Ashwin Basan explained he's raising the alert level from low to medium because the five bureaus had crossed the threshold of a rate of 200 cases per 100,000 people. The expected new designation is purely advisory and does not impose any restrictions or mandates, at least not yet, Simon Marks reports. New York City has raised its COVID-19 alert level as the number of new infections ticks up in the Big Apple. The city's health commissioner says the positivity rate is now 200 for every 100,000 people. And with the alert level now at medium, city officials are required to consider restoring mask mandates in schools. Lynn Shulman heads the city council's health committee. It just shows that more people need to get vaccinated. People aren't getting the booster. There are people who aren't getting the second shot either. And that's really important. Simon Marks, Washington. Even with spotty reporting, COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations are rising again in the United States. Cases are trending up in most states and have increased by more than 50% compared with the previous week in Washington, Mississippi, Georgia, Maine, Hawaii, South Dakota, Nevada, and Montana. In New York, where the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention recommends masking while indoors, more than a quarter of the state's population is in a county with a high COVID-19 community level. The culprit this time appears to be a spinoff of Omicron's BA2 subvariant called BA.2.12.1, which was first flagged by New York State health officials in April. According to new estimates from the CDC, BA2.121, which is growing about 25% faster than its parent virus, BA2, which accounts for nearly 37% of all COVID cases across the U.S. 
That, however, is not the only Omicron offshoot the scientists are watching. U.S. Berkeley School of Public Health Infectious Disease Professor Dr. John Schwartzberg told Brian Edwards Teekert of the Upfront Show that South Africa is experiencing a fifth surge or is expecting to experience a fifth surge of COVID infections from the BA4 and BA5 subvariants. BA.4 and 0.5 do appear to be more transmissible, and more importantly, they clearly are able to evade the immunity we get from previous infection or from vaccination better than the previous subvariants of Omicron like BA.1 and BA.2. So this is very disconcerting what's happening in Southern Africa or South Africa. The hospitalizations are probably the most disconcerting part of that. Fortunately, mortality rates aren't going up as fast as we would perhaps have expected, but still this data is very preliminary. So all things clearly are, as you mentioned, Brian, pointing towards a fifth wave for South Africa. Curiously, they missed BA.2, uh, excuse me, BA.1, what we call Omicron here. Um, they had the terrible wave in their winter and then things calmed down and now coming back to winter again as, as winter approaches, they're seeing this BA.4 and 5 wreak their ugly head up. South Africa's winter is, is our summer because of uh, how the planet works. Um, so, like, Let's get into a little bit of details. Like you, you spoke about the possibility for immune evasion. Do we know or have informed guesses on whether there's a significant difference between how well these subvariants escape immunity from prior infection versus immunity from vaccination? We have hints at that uh, question to answer that question. The Unfortunately, in South Africa, the percentage of people that are vaccinated remains disturbingly low. It's in the in the 30, 35 percent range. And what we're seeing is that those people who are immunized, and when we talk about immunized in South Africa, we're primarily talking about fully immunized, meaning having, having had two jabs. Here we would say you're up to date if you've had three. So... If you look at the fully immunized population in South Africa, we don't see as much serious illness and leading to hospitalization as we see in people who have been previously infected. So there does appear to be, in this instance, more protection from vaccination uh, than from previous infection. Now, the caveat to that statement is the data is very preliminary, so this is a, an evolving story. And on the severity front, um, the fact that hospitalizations are already up suggests, I don't know, even if it's more mild, it's not uh, mild enough to kind of relax any vigilance around the virus. Well, you know, we've been saying this for a long time, and that is that people seem to have in their minds that Omicron is just a mild disease. And... Here in California and in the United States, we're seeing a significant rise now in hospitalizations. So that lag between cases being reported and hospitalizations, we're now seeing hospitalizations show up. And that's very disturbing. The good news here is that we started at a very low level of hospitalizations. And so even a 200% increase still doesn't lead to a lot of hospitalizations. So we have a lot of play still in the system, but we have to get out of our minds that Omicron is just a benign um, cold-like virus. That's just not the case. There is one other piece of good news here in the U.S., though, with that data, and that is that deaths, well, in some parts of the country are slightly rising. We're not seeing a commensurate rise in death in most of the country, including California. So while cases are rising and we're starting to see now hospitalizations rise, we're not seeing yet the deaths rise. As a matter of fact, deaths are, are 
continuing to go down here in California, which is great to see. Dr. John Schwartzberg of the UC Berkeley School of Public Health. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Brian Edwards Tinkert from Upfront. When we're running down a story or an idea or a debate, we follow our research wherever it takes us. We've interviewed everyone from the head of California's Republican Party to an insurrectionist making the case for property destruction. The thing I love about this job is the moment when we ask a question and you can hear the person on the other end thinking. They are off their talking points. You don't know what's going to come out next. Sometimes it's profound. Usually it's interesting. That's why when the news moves fast, we take the time to go deep. It's up front at 7 a.m. right after Democracy Now! on KPFA. Ohio's primary election today includes candidates in the race for governor as well as many U.S. congressional districts. But the race to fill retiring U.S. Republican Senator Rob Portman's seat is getting all the national attention. Mary Sherman reports. To start, it's an open seat race in a quintessential swing state with the possibility of a competitive general election in the fall. And Jacob Rubaskin, a reporter and analyst with Inside Elections, explains that former President Donald Trump held a fire grip over the field of eight candidates. Making all of these candidates come down to Mar-a-Lago and really relishing in the fact that almost all of these candidates, with of course the exception of Matt Dolan, are going above and beyond to try and win his endorsement because the former president is still the most influential figure in the Republican Party. Trump endorsed J.D. Vance, an author and political newcomer who reversed his anti-Trump stance when he entered the race. Vance had been neck and neck with former state treasurer Josh Mandel, who was backed by Texas Republican U.S. Senator Ted Cruz and former General Michael Flynn. But now Vance holds a slight edge in polling over Mandel and State Senator Matt Dolan. On the Democratic side, Rubashkin says U.S. Congressman Tim Ryan of Youngstown is the clear front runner over attorney Morgan Harper, who worked for the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Morgan Harper is a credible candidate. She was not able to generate the same level of enthusiasm as some other progressive challengers in recent Senate primary memory. Tim Ryan has the support of pretty much the entire Democratic establishment. He's got the money. He's got the campaign infrastructure. Whether it's a Democrat or Republican, Rabashkin says Ohioans can expect a different approach from whoever fills Portman's seat. He is a figure from a previous era of politics. This is a guy who served in the George W. Bush administration. He represents perhaps a more temperamentally moderate, pragmatic wing of the party. Portman served in the U.S. House from 1993 to 2005. He's been a U.S. Senator for Ohio since 2011. For Ohio News Connection, I'm Mary Sherman. Former President Donald Trump's businesses and inaugural committee have reached a deal to pay Washington, D.C. $750,000 to resolve a lawsuit that alleged the committee overpaid for events at the Trump International Hotel and enriched the former president's family in the process. That's according to the District of Columbia's Attorney General. Attorney General Carl Racine announced the settlement agreement in a tweet today in the case against the Presidential Inaugural Committee, the Trump Organization, and the Trump International Hotel in Washington. The document has not yet been signed by a judge. In the statement, Trump blasted Racine and noted the settlement includes no admission of guilt or of liability. The Giffords Law Center has unveiled a gun violence memorial in San Francisco to commemorate the thousands of lives lost to gun violence every year. The memorial is in Sue Bierman Park, features 3,449 white flowers, one for every Californian who died from gun violence in 2020. According to the Gun Violence Archive, there have been 172 mass shootings in the nation this year. That's more than one a day across the U.S., A month ago, a mass shooting in downtown Sacramento killed six people and injured 12 others. San Francisco Mayor London Breed said that African Americans are particularly affected by gun violence in California, while they represent a small part of the population.
What we see, for example, in the state of California, even though African-American men represent 4% of the population, 28% of these flowers represent African-American men who died to gun violence in this state. And so when I think about, you know, even kids between the ages of 1 and 17, what, that's the second leading cause of death is gun violence in this state and for, for children. And the fact that we are not moving as aggressively as we can to protect our kids, to protect our communities, to protect our families from gun violence when we know there are tools to do so is really the tragi tragedy here. The Giffords Law Center bears the name of its co-founder, Gabby Giffords. The former Arizona congresswoman was shot in the head in her home state in 2011 while meeting with her constituents. She suffered permanent brain damage. Giffords Executive Director Peter Ambler said one solution is to make weapons manufacturers and sellers responsible for the deaths and injuries their firearms cause. Right now in Sacramento, we're fighting uh, for legislation that will help victims of gun violence be able to have their day in court um, uh, and hold the industry responsible. For too long, the industry, the firearms industry, has been immunized from legal liability when it comes to the gun violence that they're responsible for, and we're working to change that. Former Oakland City Council member Lynette McElhaney lost her son to gun violence. She said it will be impossible to end it without fighting poverty and investing in kids. My son was killed in an impoverished neighborhood a mile and a half away from a very affluent university, one of the top tier universities in the country, in the world. And what we know is that poverty itself is a type of violence and we're creating conditions by which boys have guns and they cry in bullets. So we have to love us completely. Every child should have access to a quality education, after school care, and purpose in life. So we should remove barriers to employment for their family members and for youth. The Giffords Law Center will host a candlelight vigil tonight at 745 in Sue Beerman Park to honor the lives lost to gun violence. The memorial is open to the public on May 6th. Norman Mineta, who as a federal transportation secretary ordered commercial flights grounded after the September 11th attacks in 2001 has died. He was 90 years old. John Flaherty, Mineta's former chief of staff, said Mineta died today at his home in Edgewater, Maryland, east of the nation's capital. Mineta broke racial barriers in becoming mayor of San Jose. Then he became a 10-term congressman representing Silicon Valley from 1975 to 1995 and championed civil liberties and played a key role in obtaining an official apology and compensation for Japanese Americans who were interned in concentration camps during World War II. He later became the first Asian American to become a federal cabinet secretary, serving under both Democrat Bill Clinton and Republican George W. Bush. As Bush's transportation secretary, Mineta led the department during the 2001 attacks and was later charged with restoring confidence in air travel in the aftermath of September 11th. Former South Bay Congressman Norman Mineta, dead at the age of 90. And if you are listening to KBFK for this newscast in Southern California, let me remind you that today is the first day of the Spring Fun Drive at KBFK, and we are seeking your financial support. Please give us a call at 818-985-5735. That's 818-985-5735. Or please online at kpfk.org, kpfk.org, where you can see our thank you gifts and get one for a contribution, kpfk.org. Mostly sunny tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the low 60s. Inland, it's heating up with highs in the upper 80s under sunny skies tomorrow. Hot. In the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow with highs in the low 90s under sunny skies. Sunny in Los Angeles, high in the upper 70s.
Tune in Tuesday nights starting at 7 p.m. with the Rasa Chronicles, a weekly Latinx affairs magazine program with local and international focus, highlighting the social, political, and cultural events affecting the Latinx community. After that, it's international jazz, Latin jazz, and more on bebop, kubop, and the musical truth with Avacha. At 10 p.m., it's the Reggae Express with Spliff Skankin and Tony Moses. That's Tuesday nights on 94.1 FM KPFA and kpfa.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K24-8BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org. 